Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to another exciting lesson on WhatDoYouBelieveTV.com. We are going through the book, Disciples That Make Disciples, 12 Lessons in Christian Leadership. And today's lesson is on humility. Disciples are humble. Lesson four in the book. It is going to be a powerful, life-changing message. I share a personal story about how God humbled me and changed my way of thinking so that I could become a leader in the church. A lot of times we look at pastors and we think, that they act as know-it-alls or haven't gone through anything. You're going to hear about how God changed my life. I hope that he does the same in your life. Listen to the message, come back at the end, and I'll give you some instructions. Get ready. Disciples are humble. All right, welcome everybody to WhatDoYouBelieveTV.com. We're going to get started in our lesson today. Just want to remind you how we do every lesson here in online discipleship. It's as easy as one, two, three. We want you to watch the weekly video, do the weekly lessons, and have accountability. The videos are always found on YouTube, and they're free. The weekly lessons, we're using the book Disciples That Make Disciples, and that's free as well in PDF form as an online book. And then having accountability is where you simply find somebody that you can share your life with and confess your faults and weaknesses and be prayed with and encouraged. I'll go over the checklist at the end, and uh, we'll get started today in Lesson 4. So glad that you're joining with us today. Lesson 4 is on the subject, Disciples Are Humble. This is definitely going to be a challenging lesson for everyone because this is the uh, number one thing that we all deal with. Pride is the opposite of humility. Pride was the first sin of Satan. Pride was the first sin of Adam and Eve. And I would uh, actually dare to argue that all sins come from pride. And so the opposite of pride is humility. Christ was humble. We need to be humble. And as we are humble, we will be who Christ called us to be. So let's get into lesson four today. Disciples are humble. The section here is entitled The Kenosis. That's a Greek word, and I'm going to teach you about that. Let's get ready to start. Though Jesus was fully God and equal to the Father in all ways as the second person in the Trinity, he lowered himself and became man. Thus, Jesus became the God-man, 100% divine and 100% man. We'll get more into the doctrine of the Trinity when we get into the lesson defending the faith, but the simple Bible doctrine is this. There is one God, and three persons make up the one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each one are equally God. So it's not like, you know, 33.3% is the Father's nature of God and 33.3% you know, is the nature of Jesus and they're divided into thirds, you know, a third God, a third God. No, they're all 100% God, yet they are separate persons. And the way to look at this would be human beings can be many human beings, but yet be the same kind of being, a human being. So when I look at somebody else, I say, that's a separate person than me. They're not me, but they are equality to me in their nature. They are a human being. So when the Father sees the Son, the Son sees the Holy Spirit, they are all equal in their being. They are all God, yet they are separate persons. Now, the difference between the example of human beings and God is we would then say there's three human beings, three kinds of of uh, persons there that make three individual human beings. And so we don't want to say that there's three kinds of gods, three separate gods. This is where God's nature is more complex than us. God's complexity is that these three persons are still one being. Now that's where we enter into faith, understanding that by faith, taking it from the revelation of God. And there are scriptures, especially in the Psalms like David, where Jesus is speaking speaking and uh, in saying, who can you compare to me? There's nothing on the earth, nothing in heaven. I am like no one. And so I believe the complexity and unity is what separates him in his uh, nature from all of us. He is three separate persons in one. And the only illustration we really
really have of this, though it's not uh, perfectly complete as an illustration. But in the beginning, the Bible says that Adam and Eve, when they joined together in sexual union and marriage, they became one. So in that sense, uh, God was, you know, showing how a unity would come before, uh, come in, you know, being by multiple persons joining together, a husband and a wife, they would become one, echad. And so that's where uh, we actually understand the Trinity from, because that was in his image, but it's three persons being one at all time. Having said that, the interesting thing here is that Jesus then takes on flesh, which then opens up a whole nother category of explanations. When he took on flesh, did he stop becoming God? No, he still was God. Now that he has taken on flesh, uh, well, when he had taken on flesh, did he have two minds? One as the mind of God, one as the mind of man. No, there was only one mind, one soul. Though he was in an earthly body, just like there's only one of you, but you're in an earthly body, and when that earthly body dies, you still remain in your soul. So there was one soul of Jesus, not two souls. That divine soul was in this body. But yet, some people then want to say, well, then Jesus was a superhuman, that his body could do things that other humans couldn't, and that he would have an unfair advantage. And that is not true. His body was limited in all ways, just like we are. And then when he came in that body, Body, he limited his God powers in that body. So his soul could have done amazing things through the body, but the body was no different than a normal body. And with his soul, he limited himself. Okay. So God, the son comes in the flesh, becomes the God man. And here's another great thing. After he resurrected, he still kept the body resurrected body though forever. He has it. He's in it. He has it now in heaven and he will forever have it. So now he forever identifies with man in his very nature, being man and God at the same time. Now, let's keep going. As I said, we'll discuss more theology and, and lessons to come. The term that is used to describe the lowering and humbling of our great Lord and Savior is the Greek word kenosis, which means to make of no reputation or to empty oneself. So what we're going to talk about as an example of humility is how Jesus would become man, how he would leave heaven and come to earth and have to partake in things that we would just, you know, take as normal. But for him, it was a humiliation. It was a humbling. He had to use the bathroom. God never, the son had to use the bathroom, but God in the flesh had to use the bathroom. He had to be uh, limited in his power, where in heaven he was never limited in his power. It's not that he stopped having it. He just limited his power and became dependent upon on the Holy Spirit. He also was persecuted, made fun of, uh, all of these things. When you see uh, before, when Satan just had a snippet of rebellion, bam, he's cast out of heaven, falls like lightning, the Bible says. Jesus said, I saw him fall like lightning. Yet when he's on earth, people mock him and ridicule him and even kill his body where the great God of all eternity never had to, you know, be in any position like this. So we're going to talk about if Jesus would do this for us, and then as a man gives us the example of humility, how much more should we be humble if he was humble? And, and let's look here as we get ready to understand this Greek word kenosis, because that really is the theological term that kind of encompasses what Jesus did to become man, to die on the cross, and to become our Savior. Jesus left his glory and place in heaven and came down to earth in the form of a man uh, to become the savior of the world. Take a moment to read Paul's description here of the kenosis. Let's look at it. It's in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, very famous part of scripture. It is called the uh, Carmen Christi, the hymn to Christ. This predates even Paul's salvation. This was in the church before Paul. So this is a hymn to Christ, most likely a song or some kind of a creed that the Christians used to recite in the early church. Here we go. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, kenosis, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Let's keep going. Verse 9. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should 
should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay, and that's where that word kenosis comes from, made himself nothing. So God, uh, God the Son, very nature God, didn't have to hold on to those divine privileges but he let go of those privileges, not letting go of the nature of God. He didn't stop becoming God. That's another error that some have taught, that when he became man, he stopped, beca stopped being God. No, he just didn't grasp to the... Uh, the rights and privileges he had in equality to God. He allowed himself to be treated as a man, whereas if he would have held on to his rights being equal with God, you know, people would have died immediately insulting him, all of these things. But he releases those privileges, not the nature itself. He releases this equality status for the time he is on earth and becomes nothing. He becomes in the nature of a servant. So that's where we know he has two natures. Jesus has the human nature and the uh, God nature. And yet these two natures don't make two Jesuses. It's just saying Jesus has a physical body and a God soul inner self. And that is, by the way, the example of us, but leaving out deity. We have a soul and inner self and a body. Eventually this body will die. Then we'll take on a resurrected body. So we'll have a physical body nature forever in eternity and that spiritual soulical nature. But we're not God. And so it's the same thing. The body is not Jesus. The soul spiritual nature is Jesus. Okay. And it dwells, he, he dwells in the body. Now let's go on and understand this a little bit more. If Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, the bright and morning star, the Alpha and the Omega, would make himself nothing and become a man that could die for the sins of the world, how much more should we, his disciples, learn to humble ourselves and make life not about our selfish needs and desires? Come on, somebody, get that in your heart. If Jesus could make it about serving the Father, how much more could we make it about serving him? Jesus gave the greatest example of a servant when he left the worship of angels in heaven and became a man on earth to die on the cross for the sins of the world. He displayed the highest degree of humanity by becoming a man subject to the natural laws of the human condition, such as hunger, fatigue, and even death. And now you understand how he did that. He did that by becoming a man inside uh, you know, the man Jesus was the God from all eternity, but the man that he lived, the body, that physical body he lived within, had to get hungry to know when to eat, was tired, so it needed to rest and even could die. And that's why another time, another time, uh, another way people uh, don't understand this is they say, well, how could you kill God? Well, once again, and first of all, no one really kills uh, the uh, nobody really kills the soul. We, God said he can destroy and torture that soul. That's what he was talking about. But the soul lives on forever. What died the day of the crucifixion for Jesus was simply his body. Just like if your body died, you would continue to go, go on. So when people say, who killed God? You know, there wasn't a destruction of God in his fullness. It was simply the body of Jesus died that day. Why? Because Jesus took on an earth suit, a tent, to be with us. And the way I like to look at his physical body is, imagine us, when we go to space, we put on a space suit so we can operate in space. Well, Jesus, to come to earth, he put on an earth suit, the flesh, so that he can operate and be among us. When the earth suit died, he was still alive. And uh, another way to look at it is in John chapter 1, it said he made his dwelling among us. And that word dwelling among us literally means he tabernacled next to us. So Jesus took on the tent of a body to be with us. He tabernacled is another word for a tent or a home. He built his home in the body to be with us. So the body could suffer, the body would die, but he would never do it. Now, having all those theological issues aside, God in the flesh was hungry. God in the flesh was fatigued. What great humility for him to endure such things. During his ministry, Jesus never made people feel that he was too good for them. He loved to serve people and be there for them in their times of needs. Jesus showed great humility in his relationship with the 12 disciples. He was always patient and forgiving towards them, even when they betrayed him. Jesus was a great leader by being a great servant. 
And then you'll see this played out in uh, Luke chapter 22, 24, and 27. It says, Also a great dispute arose among them, this is the disciples, as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. So the disciples are hanging around Jesus. They're like, hey, which one of you, which, which one of us is the greatest? Which one do you think is the best? And, you know, they're like, Peter's like, I'm the best. I walked on water. And they're all going back and forth. And Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them. And those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. You know, they benefit. You know, Lord, lo landlord is like a word there. But you are not to be like this. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Wow. So Jesus says, I've come to serve you. I didn't come to lord my authority over you. So what have we learned in this first section? Simply that Jesus, the God, the Son of God, came in the flesh to become man so that he might die on the cross for our sins. And as a man, he humbled himself and, made his, and was made a servant, even serving unto death. And when they fought about who was greatest, Jesus said, though I am the greatest, I show my greatness by being a servant. Therefore, the servant, the one who serves, is the greatest. This is a lesson on humility. I know that the Lord is probably already convicting you as he's convicting me. How much more can we act in this way? This should be the commonality of all Christians, humility. Now here I tell a story about myself. And one of the times that I learned it in the most extreme way, I uh, continue to want to walk in humility, but this was really the time of my life that I had to learn humility. And it, they call this section, Who's the Boss? And you look at this picture here, and I'm really trying to use this picture to describe who I was at that time. And it's so funny because I looked probably very, very similar to that. And I won't read the story here. I'll just simply tell it to you. I was in Bible college after nine months of being saved. I had already preached before I went to Bible college, and I really felt that I knew a lot about the Bible. Well, in Bible college, I started to have different disagreements with the professors. My issue wasn't, you know, sneaking out, smoking cigarettes, or cursing. My issue was pride. I really just felt like I knew everything, and I just wanted to argue with the professors. Well, there came to be a time where uh, I had insulted one of the professors so badly that they uh, got all together, and with the dean of students, they brought me in to discipline me, and they said, if you don't change your behavior, we're going to kick you out. And one of the ways we want you to change your behavior is we want you to learn to be a servant. We want you to start cleaning the toilets, cleaning the restrooms, and we want you to get this in your mindset. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's about serving people, serving God. And you know, sometimes we look at Christianity as a place of just free for all. We just love everybody. But that's not true either. You know, there's discipline. There's there's respect and honor. And I thank God for those with authority. You know, it's something, just a little side note, a lot of times when... Uh, uh, people have pride. What they like to do is become spec inspectors, and they like to correct the correctors. You know, uh, you know when somebody's uh, in leadership correcting them, they then tell them, "Well, you know, you have all of your problems." You know, and that was exactly how I was. And I was like, "Let me tell you what I think about you guys." You know, I'm going to correct the corrector. I'm going to be a spec inspector. I'm going to look at the spec in your eye now. And uh, that didn't work with them. They said, okay, you need to get out then. I said, well, I know I'm right, so I'm going to get out. And so after trying to teach the Bible college how to have a good Bible college, I said, they're not willing to listen, so I'm going to go on to the next one. And I uh, went to a gas station to get some gas. I packed up my car, went to a gas station. And there in the south, I was in New Orleans, everybody greets each other. And they say, hey, how you doing? How you doing? You know, just anywhere, gas stations, it doesn't matter, stores. And so, uh, you know, I would always respond back to them. You know, every day is a good day with Jesus. You know, this is an opportunity to preach. Well, there I was at the gas station, and I heard them say, you know, how are you doing? Somebody said that to me. And I go, oh, you know, I'm okay. And I just blew it off. I had no ability to share my testimony that day. It was no ability to say every day is a good day with, with Jesus because I was grieving the Lord. And I felt at that moment the Lord speak to my heart. If you don't go back, I won't go with you where you're going. So it was like the Lord gave me an ultimatum. He said, if you go where you're going, I'm not going. But if you go back, I'll go with you. 
That's because that's where I'm going. I'm going the way of humility. Oh, and it broke my heart. And I uh, went back that night and I was just so broken. And, and I called up Brother Anthony Freeman. He was the dean of men, and I said, oh, Brother Anthony, would you please forgive me? I don't know how to change, but I know you guys can help me change, but I know I'm wrong, and I need help, and I need to see this pride. I just felt the Lord tell me he wouldn't even go with me if I went in a different direction. And he said, yes, I forgive you, but you still have to be under the discipline. And so for those next two years of Bible college, I was always put under discipline in some form or fashion. I was always uh, held in a higher standard to that level of correction because they weren't going to let me get away with it. Sometimes I felt like they were picking on me, but I knew they did it for my good. And I want to encourage you today, friends, if you're in leadership, or excuse me, in a church with leadership, they should help you see the pride in you. That's the best thing a leader can do. And so here I pack up my car and I go back to the Bible college and Here's one of the wonderful things that I gained from that is Brother, Brother Anthony Freeman has been a spiritual father mentor to me all of those years, literally going on 16 years now, 11 years when I wrote this book, so it's been five years since I wrote this lesson, 16 years, the same man speaking into my life. Isn't that wonderful? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, 15, even though you have 10,000 uh, guardians in Christ, you don't have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Today, I have a spiritual father because I can humble myself. For many reading this booklet, you need to do the same. I look back on that day even with tears in my eyes. Excuse me. I thank God that he loved me enough to tell me when I was wrong and needed to change. My punishment in the school was to clean the toilets every, every day until they said I changed my attitude. I've never been the same since. Today, as a pastor, I see many people leave one church and go to the next, just like I tried that day, and they don't take time to listen to see if God is in, if God is the one who is actually correcting them. I ask that you would read the following verses and then pray and ask God to humble you. First Peter five five through six. Young men, and in this sense, young men just means those not in authority in the church. This was the younger spiritual men that I believe, as I've looked into other commentaries, that's what it means. It's not just simply saying. You know, if you're old, you, you, you know, you got it together. You're a humble person. Because we know as older men, which I'm not as young as I used to be, I know I still struggle with it. So really what it's talking about is younger in authority, younger in spiritual matters. Young men, in the same way, submit to those who are older, more mature. All of you clothe yourselves, and here's the lesson, all of you clothe yourselves with humility. Just think of humility as putting on the cloth of humility, the clothes, the designer cloth of humility. And clothe yourself with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. You know, I hear so often people doing things in pride and I look at them even as Christians and I don't see any grieving or any, uh, you know, outward, you know, a repentance. And I wonder, how can that be going on? I mean, I wasn't even cussing, smoking or drinking. I was just arguing with my professors and man, I felt the resistance. I felt God's hand against me. I couldn't even greet somebody at a gas station. I say, what's going on with those people? Why do they feel no grieving? Even in my ministry, I've seen people act out of the most pride and yet there's no grieving. And I began to understand that they don't know the voice of the Lord. Oh, what a sad day that must be when, like a Samson, people don't know that the Spirit of the Lord has left them until it's too late. Well, my friends, those of you who hear the Spirit of God correcting you, either through leadership or through your personal devotions of pride, I would just compel you, listen to the, the, the compelling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, is a good thing. He is there to help you because when you no longer hear Him, you are no longer his. Oh, my friends, do not let your pride separate you from God as it did with so many in the Bible, Samson, Saul, Judas, the devil himself. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace, karas, gifts to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. I feel like praying right about now. <laughs> Hallelujah. You pray something like this with me today, friends. Father, I come to you today and I ask that you would teach me to be humble like your son, Jesus. 
Father, I pray that you will teach me how to listen to others and follow the leadership that you have placed in my life. Take away my pride and make me a leader that serves. Transform my life by your power in Jesus' name. Oh, amen and amen. It's not that God doesn't want us to be leaders. He does, but he wants us to be servant leaders. And it's not that he wants his leaders to somehow become slaves to people's opinions or people's demands. You know, Jesus didn't do everything people wanted him to do. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been crucified. You don't crucify somebody you love or somebody who does what you want him to do. You know, Jesus didn't stop preaching when they wanted him to. He said, go tell that fox, Herod, I'll keep preaching here and everywhere else. And he didn't go to festivals when his brothers tried to manipulate him to go. And he didn't let himself be made a king when the politicians wanted him to be a king. And, you know, he didn't just be swayed in all different manner of ways. When a rich man wanted to follow him on his own terms, he told the rich man, you're not fit uh, for the kingdom of God. You know, Jesus didn't just do what everybody wanted him to do, but he was under authority, good authority. He was under the authority of his father. And he taught that authority to his disciples and his disciples to have disciples and do you know if everybody was rebellious, the Bible never would have been handed down? You know if uh, Timothy would have said to Paul, Paul, who are you? I don't need to listen to this. I'll do whatever I want to do. And if people said back to Peter, well, Peter, that's your opinion. I'll do it my way. I got Jesus too. Do you know that there would be no Bible? There had to be a start of authority upon this earth with Jesus than his disciples. And I'm not saying man can't let you down, friends. But if you say I'm humble, yet you're not under authority. Your humility is an illusion. Humility comes from serving people, and it starts with leadership. And if you're this kind of person that goes to YouTube University and Google College and you think you know it all, I want to give you the same advice that Peter gave his people and the same story uh, from my story. Humble yourself, woman or man of God. Humble yourself. If there is no church that you can find that is worthy of you following and humbling, it's your problem, not the church's problem. The church is built with imperfect people, but who are perfectly going after God. Their, their hearts are right, aren't they? Shouldn't they desire to do the right thing? I know we do. And if we make mistakes, we change it. And so I want to ask you to find a good church. Find good leaders, spiritual mentors who can help see the pride in you. You need to have someone mentor and disciple you. Let me give you 10 scriptures here that I believe teach humility. And it's going to hit on a lot of different things. And I have the comments below each scripture, but I won't read the comments because I'm here commenting for you. I'll just simply read the scripture. And uh, you can do that on your own. Exodus 10, 3. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go so that they may worship me. Do you know that Pharaoh's hard heart did not even allow him to humble himself after he saw the Red Sea, uh, excuse me, uh, the Nile River turn to blood? Do you know that he did not even humble himself after he had uh, lost his firstborn son? He even still chased after the Israelites. And then when he saw the Red Sea parted by that same God who had sent all those plagues and even killed his firstborn son, he had so much pride he ran into the Red Sea that was parted by by the God who had been punishing him. And of course, what happened? The Red Sea closed and destroyed him. My friends, sin and pride will make a fool of you. Hear this again. Pride will make a fool of you. Don't be prideful. Humble yourself. See the warnings of God before your pride destroys you. Don't be destroyed in your pride. God will oppose you and destroy you. He is very clear about that. He hates the haughty in heart. The Bible says that haughty heart he hates. He will destroy the prideful. One day there is a hell prideful people will go to. Go to the mercy seat of God. Now plead for mercy, all you prideful folks. And ask God to humble you and change you. Fall upon him so he'll have mercy lest he fall upon you and break you into pieces. Deuteronomy 8.2, number two scripture. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. Do you know that as God led the Israelites for 40 years in the desert to test them, God does that with us today? 
to humble us. Many times we in ministry are brought through the humble road. You know why? So that we won't be prideful in our own success. Do you know that God allows you young believers to go through testing because he wants to know, are you serving him just because you get a new house, a new pony, and a new job? Or are you really serving him because you love him and you want to do what he commands? What you go through many times is the Lord's testing to see if you're truly humble. Does he test his people? You better believe it. As the blacksmith tests the gold and refines it by fire, so does the Lord refine and test the heart of man to purify it from all pride and sin. Oh, come on. That's what the Bible says. Uh, third scripture, Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The humility doesn't just apply to people in the church or, you know, certain situations in your life. It applies to nations. If America now will humble itself and pray just as George Washington did in the first Thanksgiving address. Read that prayer. Google it. You'll find it. George Washington's first Thanksgiving address in our newly founded country was, God, we take this time out to be thankful lest we become, you know, greedy and prideful and think this is of our own doing. And we also take this time to repent of any sins we've done. Read it. It's powerful. So then you wonder that God blessed our nation. So we need to go back to that. Our nation needs to humble itself. And a nation is only but its people. And so you need to humble yourself. Second Chronicles 34, 27. And by the way, that was uh, God's promise to Solomon that if the people of Israel were ever in trouble, if they would humble themselves and pray, God would have mercy on them. Second Chronicles 34, 27. Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before God when you heard what he spoke against this place and its people, because you humbled yourself before me and tore your robes and wept in my presence, I've heard you, declares the Lord. And here is an example when King Josiah, as a king, started to break the laws, enemies started to come against him, God was going to destroy the land, but because he humbled himself, the land was spared. Eventually, Israel continued in pride, and God sent them into captivity. What a lesson to all of the prideful people today. God will punish and judge his people. Proverbs 29, 23, a man's pride brings him low, but a man of lowly spirit gains honor. The way I look at this is a man kneeled down can't be forced to kneel. So if you already are kneeling down humbly, nobody can humiliate you and shame you and bring you to your knees. But a knelt man can be made to stand and no one can knock him down. You see, this is the principle of God. If you're kneeling on your own in humility, no one can knock you down. Don't be afraid of what people think about you in your times of humility and testings. And maybe you sometimes feel that people take advantage of you. I would recommend the book by John Bevere, Undercover, as he tells the story about how even sometimes in ministry he went through hardships. But while being humble, God honored him and lifted him up where he could stand and no one could pull him down. See, because if you stand in your own might, God will bring you down. But kneel, choose to kneel, let God honor you. That's a wonderful thing to remember. God blesses the humble. Isaiah 57, 15. For this is what the high and lofty one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. Okay, so God's talking here. We know what this is. I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. And contrite just means, you know, humble. Oh, my goodness, friends, what a promise. This high and lofty God will live with the lowly and the contrite. Not, you know, false humility, walking around going, nobody loves me, nobody cares for me. See, God, I'm so humble. No, that's not true humility. True humility is knowing who you are, and accepting it, just knowing who you are. If you're a good basketball player, know who you are. Just accept it. You know, if people ask you, can you play good? Don't say, well, I don't think I can play good. That's a lie. If you can play good, say you can play good. Confidence, rather, it's not pride. Don't think confidence is pride. If you're at a job interview and they say, hey, we're looking at 20 other applicants here. Uh, we're not sure if you're the right one. Why should we hire you? You shouldn't say, well, you know, I am not the right one and I don't know what I'm doing. You know, that's how humble I am. No, you should say, well, I am the best. If you are, you know, I can do X, Y, and Z. I can type this way. I can file this way. I can organize this way. 
Confidence is not pride. So there's two forms of pride. There's self-abasing, putting yourself down. I'm nobody. God doesn't love me. And then there's self-adornment. Just, oh, I'm so awesome. I'm so beautiful. Self-abasement, self-adorning are both forms of pride. But uh, true humility is just knowing who you are. So when it's talking about the lowly, the contrite, it's saying, I know who I am to God. To God, I'm nothing. To God, man, I can't even, I can't even breathe without God. I recognize that. And God goes, I want to be with that guy. I want to be with the person who really knows who I am and who they are in comparison to me. Then he says, to that person, the poor in spirit, I'll give them the kingdom of heaven. To those who mourn, I will comfort them. Uh, you know, to those who are meek, I will give them the earth. You know, so God just blesses these people because they know who they are and they know who he is. That's true humility. Here we get some of the teachings of Jesus now, Matthew 18, 4, uh, Matthew chapter 18, 4. Jesus says, therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, wouldn't that just blow your mind, all this religious, all these religious people, rabbis everywhere, and Jesus just grabs a child and says, hey guys, you want to be great? It's not at seminary, you don't get greatness at seminary, politics, all of that. You want to be great? Be like this child. Why? Because when we call him to come, he comes. When we say to go, he goes. You know, an obedient child. This wouldn't work for a rebellious child, but an obedient child like my children. Not saying they're perfect, but when I call them to come, they come. When, when I ask them to do something, they do it. When I tell them to believe this, they're so impressionable, they believe this. That is what our heart is supposed to be. And that's why, parents, you have such an important job to frame the conscience of the child, to train them in the way of the Lord, so that when they're old, they will not depart, because they're, they're so uh, you know, vulnerable and frameable uh, at that time. Matthew 23, 12. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus is saying that the way is the way up in the kingdom is down, and the way to go down is the way up. And the, you know, it's the opposite. If you want to be great, go down, and he'll lift you up. If you're thinking that you're up, you're really going to come down. Understand that God turns the world upside down, or rather, in His mind, side He puts it right side up. He gets us to think about it correctly. Then in Hebrews 13, 17, now dealing with churches and people, because once again, so many times people say, well, I'm humble, I serve God, but I don't need to listen to you, pastor. Who are you to tell me what to do? You remember what happened when uh, the people of Israel did that with Moses? There was some trouble that came. If you don't know that story, go ahead and look up the sons of Korah. And it's the same thing in the New Testament. You know, everybody could have said, hey, we got Jesus, we got the Holy Spirit. We certainly don't need anybody now. We're the priesthood of the believer. But the writer of Hebrews emphasizes that the same as, as Peter was in Paul. He says, obey your leaders. Submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. And I would challenge you, if you really want to understand true godly authority, because there is and there are some bad people out there, okay? I would say get the book, The Tale of Three Kings, Tale of Three Kings, good book. I would recommend just understanding what is bad authority and should never be submitted to. Bad authority would cause you to sin. Uh, you know, you know, just stealing money and asking you to hide it or, uh, you know, women, a man, you know, coming at you inappropriately or, uh, you know, physical abuse or just verbal abuse that continues. And it just, you know, just bad authority. There is such a thing. OK, so we're not talking about submitting and continuing to submit to bad authority. Three Kings will help you understand that. And I'll, I'll put these links up for you as well on the blog. But once you get a church with sound doctrine, good men, uh, leaders, women, you know, people who are accountable to each other, that's a good sign of a good church is when they have authority over them as well. Like I as a pastor have a pastor over me. That's a good sign. Uh, you should submit to those things in the church, even if sometimes you don't agree. Because if it's not doctrinal error and if it's not sin, then it's simply things of disagreement. There are gray areas. For example, in our church, uh, we say if you're going to be a leader, uh, you've got to come to the 201, do this class, you know, and write some, you know, uh, do the questions and do the memory verses every week. So somebody goes, oh, I don't want to do that, but I still want to be a leader. See, that's rebellion. 
If you don't want to do that, there's another church down the road that you can do it over there. But eventually you're going to get to a church that they're going to ask you to do something you don't want to do. Otherwise, you're going to start your own church and then God won't bless your mess. At some point, we all have to give in to leadership. Because leadership, just like relationships, is going to do things from time to time we don't agree with. That's why Paul uh, says in his letters, you don't, you, you know, you don't, uh, you have a lot of instructors, but you don't have fathers. You need to find fathers, people you trust in the ministry. And that's why Peter said, younger men, those less mature, submit to the mature. And then here, the author of Hebrews is saying, obey your leaders twice. Uh, obey, submit to them, and obey them so that their work is a joy. And I can say as a pastor, when people get over their attitudes and just see the simplicity of the gospel and serve with us in our methods, you know, because that's really what it is between, you know, it's not doctrine or sin, it's just our methods. You know, if you're going to be a leader and miss, you need to give us two weeks notice, or if you're sick, let somebody know. Come on, you don't give God less than what you would give your job, people. Obey, submit to those things. And as I always say, if you don't like it here, go somewhere else. But eventually your heart will get exposed because every good pastor in church I know has an order. And those relationships are built on humility. And by the way, that's what I had to learn in Bible college. <laughs> Wasn't my idea to clean toilets. And as we started this church here, you know how many times I've had to clean the toilets? Praise God for the lesson learned. I'm a good toilet cleaner now. Amen. Uh, James 4, 6, our last scripture here is, but he gives us more grace. Grace in the Greek is kairos, more gifts. That's literally what it means. He gives us more gifts. That is why the scripture said God opposes the proud, but gives gifts, gives grace to the humble. See, God will be with the humble. If you're in the church and in the church setting and you're really like, man, this is hard, you know, I'm not used to memorizing verses or I'm not used to being uh, held to such a high standard. Ask God to help you. He'll give you his grace. He'll give you the gifts to be able to do that. And if you're in a good church that's teaching sound doctrine and, and there's not sin really, you know, being approved of and they're against sin and they're loving God, Oh, man, those good things will, will build discipline in your life. And remember, disciple and discipline have the same root word. Uh, you know, it's a good thing to have discipline in your life. That's why the Bible says, you know, to, to be like a soldier, not involved in civilian affairs, but pleasing the general over you. I mean, read some of the examples in the Bible, and then you'll see them now from the, from the perspective of humility. And if you look at Jesus's uh parables. Do you always notice that there's a master and some servants? You know, the parable of the stewards, there's a master and a stir, st servants, you know, and then there's the parable of the vineyard, the, you know, the owner of the land and the one he rents it out to. Have you ever noticed that the shrewd manager, there's the boss and then there's the, the manager. Have you ever noticed that there's always this kind of concept of people with authority? Jesus wasn't saying there would be no authority. He was just saying in the exercise of authority, we all need to be humble. Those in authority and those under the authority, be humble, walk some Submissively. Now let me give you five ways in conclusion here to live practically humble. This is just something for you to walk away from this lesson after those 10 scriptures to be humble. Remember, Jesus is our example. He came in the flesh. He died on the cross. He allowed himself to be persecuted to show us the example of humility. He limited his ability to only what the Father said. That's why he said the Father is greater than I, because he said, I can't do anything unless I see the Father do it. So Jesus wasn't even on his own agenda. That's why when they asked him, when are you coming back? He says, I don't even know. The Son of Man does doesn't even know, but the Father in heaven. Now, obviously, we know he knows now, but when he was on earth, he was limited in what he could pull out of his divine privileges because he submitted to only what the Father would give him. How much more should we do so? Here's five ways to do it. Now, let's go through them quickly, and then we'll go each one in a little more detail. Number one, submit to God's Word. So you got to be a part of the Bible. Under, I mean, submit to the Bible. Number two, be under authority in the church. So don't be, don't try to be a one-man football team. Hello, somebody. You ever see a one-man baseball team win the World Series? Yes, you are saved and a part of the church, but you're not out there to be by yourself. Get getting to be in the church. And like I said, these know-it-all spec inspectors and correctors of the correctors who can't find churches, come on, somebody. We live in America, land of the free, churches on every corner, pastors of every flavor. You can't find a church. Hello, you ain't that special, baby. You better find a church and stop acting like a know-it-all. Humble yourself. And number three, have an accountability partner. So now the church kind of gets more personal to where there's people in your life that will hold you accountable to the standards of the Bible. Don't get lost in the crowd of a church. That's why we do life groups and discipleship at our church. We offer that for people. 
then follow the guidelines for Christian family. There's, you know, humility that's supposed to come in each level. There's a humility of the husband, a humility of the wife, humility of the children, humility of the father, humility of the mother, and, you know, humility of the children once again. They have to humble themselves in both situations, but uh, to, their, uh, to their parents who are in charge of the house. And so you learn how to operate in every aspect in humility. And then lastly, of course, obey the laws of the land and, and laws that don't cause you to sin or break the doctrines of the faith as well. So uh, there is time to uprise and to fight against uh, bad governments. And we've done that in America. Thank, the, thank God that for 4th of July, we're no longer under the British uh, with no taxation, without representation, uh, but in, unless there is no oppression and uh, there there's freedom and, and way we have it in America, unless it causes you to sin or, or break your, your conscience, just obey the speed limit, you know, come on, speaking to myself here, pay your taxes, do what's right, be fair uh, as well. If you're a politician and if you're listening to this, be fair to people under you. I believe that's what made America great to begin with. And uh, just to go through these now a little bit more in detail, Submitting to God's Word, 2 Timothy 3.16, it's the God-breathed Word. I would say study the Word, understand the Word, submit to it. If you do have questions, investigate it. Don't be afraid to ask questions from the Word of God. It can defend itself, but there has to be a simple faith in there at some point where you say, I believe. You know, we've never seen the Trinity, but at some point you have to say, this is the scriptural revelation. I either choose to believe it or not believe it. I really... Uh, would, would encourage you to, after studying it, uh, to take that step of faith and believe it. Uh, the authority under the church, uh, the way it works in our church is elders and deacons. For you, it may be in your youth group, uh, it may be with uh, life group leaders, you know, small group leaders, pastors, etc. You need to find a good church where you can submit to these men and women and trust them. And uh, they shouldn't be meddling and getting, you know, all into your personal life, uh, they shouldn't be like, you know, what uh, what do you do with your husband behind closed doors, you know, or uh, what food do you eat and, uh, uh, you know, what clothes do you wear and uh, what do you do with your other 90% of your money? How do you spend your money? I don't think there needs to be this what's called meddling, but I, I believe the Bible gives us enough biblical training that the church should be involved in a person's life, like what they believe. So you should be accountable to your church of what you believe. So membership, a lot of churches, requires you to sign a doctrinal statement. I believe it's right to ask members of the church to be accountable to a tithe, to a giving standard, so that they can be depended upon for the growth of the church. I do believe it's right to do that. Some will actually check the church members' records. I don't go that far, but I do believe it's right to, to be accountable to your giving of the 10% of tithe. Also, I believe you should be accountable to how you live your life. I believe that people should be able to ask you, you know, do you have sex outside of marriage? Do you look at pornography? Are you greedy? Are you selfish? Do these things line up in your life? Go through our accountability thing. I believe that should come from the pulpit, our accountability lesson that I went to, and individually, okay? So I believe a church should be involved in those affairs. Uh, and then, of, uh, of course, here, uh, accountability part. Oh, and for obeying the church, you know, or rather being a part of church, Hebrews 3.17, we've already gone through that scripture as well. Uh, the accountability partner, James 5.16, says confess your sins to each other. You see, I believe this is where it becomes personal now. You, you hear it from the church, you hear it from the pulpit, but in our church, you know, I may have 100 plus people in there, but I can't now go up to each one of them and ask them, are you living according to this standard? And if not, what areas do you need help in and instruction in and prayer for? But accountability can do that. You can hear the messages of the church and now uh, go uh, go into a private place, men with men, women with women, and really have a time of submitting one to another. You know, you confess yours and I'll confess mine. And there needs to then be a more than just a confession. There needs to be a moving forward. And this is not a confession to receive forgiveness. This is a confession to really live it out. And, and this is important if you want to do it. If you don't want to live for God, then accountability is the last thing you want. You know, hey, if you don't want to be on a diet, then you don't want a dietitian in your life. And if you don't want to get in shape, you don't want a trainer. But if you really want to do those things, and a dietitian, a trainer are awesome, right? People pay for that in our culture. Well, what about an accountability part? If you really want to get over that attitude, you really want to have a blessed life, you want to get over pornography, you really want to get those things right, use the accountability system built for the family. Husbands, really just 
Look at your role of leadership as being the servant of all. That's what Jesus said, right? The greatest among us will be the servant. Yes, you get the final say in the house, but it should be from the perspective of what benefits the house. And why is uh, find a good man to submit to. This is why it's important not to be unequally yoked. Women a lot of times get duped into trying to uh, missionary date their, their spouses, their men, to, to see them get saved. And while they get married, their, their life falls apart because these men say, now I've got the cow and the milk. I don't need to go to the barn anymore. You know, I brought the cow with me. No offense to or refer to women as a cow. Lord, forgive me for that. But you get what I'm saying? He, he doesn't need to do anything else now. He's already got you. And then lastly, children, uh, don't be uh, prideful with your parents, even if they're not saved. The best thing you can do in your testimony is really show your parents an obedient heart. And of course, if they ask you to sin or break the, the doctrines of the Bible, don't do it. But, you know, even if your family's unsaved, I guarantee you they want you to do good in school. They want you to stay out of trouble. Uh, they want you to listen to them, clean your room, things like that. And uh, we go into that a lot more depth in Lesson 5. And then lastly here, follow the rules of society. Uh, if you live in America, you have a great uh, country to live in. Uh, as far as I know, there is no law that causes us to break our conscience to serving the Lord. So there is nothing that I can really think of that forces us to do something against our conscience. If you can think of something, you can let me know. But I see of no reason to break any laws in our country uh, according to our Christian conviction. We have the freedom of religion here. We have privacy in our homes to teach our children uh, what we want. So I would say follow the rules of society. Be known as law-abiding citizens. And for those of you who want to get into politics, you'll learn so much about our Constitution rooted in Christian principles. And, and you can help bring change to our culture. And so I'll pray for godly politicians to rise up, even out of this class, that you would have a desire to maybe get your degree in law and poli um, a poli sci, political science, and really understand the inner working of our culture and constitutional um constitutional law and just grow our culture in a way that it can go back to its roots. So my friends, I want to encourage you today in this lesson, the kenosis, humble yourselves, be like Christ in all ways. Look at those scriptures. Don't continue in pride if you're prideful today. I speak to the prideful and I say, repent. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. God has a tremendous, tremendous plan for you. And if you think what you're going through is something, remember what Jesus went through, leaving heaven to come to this earth. I want to give you the checklist here. Number one, read chapter four now on your own thoroughly. Look up all the scriptures for the, sec uh, the chapter, disciples are humble. Answer all the questions there at the end, honestly. Then meet with your accountability partner. Share the ups and downs and the ways that you've dealt with pride. Let's be honest, you're going to have a lot to talk about there. And then you can join the Facebook for, uh, discussion uh, page. It's optional. That's the best way to stay in touch with me. No matter when you listen to this lesson, Lord willing, as long as there's a Facebook and a YouTube, you'll be able to find us out there. And so once again, this is Joe from WhatDoYouBelieveTV.com. Hope you come back more humble than you've ever been. God bless you and have a wonderful day. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm ready to have some accountability, to pray, to seek the Lord, to check my heart that I'm walking humble. I pray that it's been the same for you. Now this week, begin to meet with your accountability partner. Share those things in your life that you want to change, things that you want to see in your heart, like humility, contrite, brokenness, not always walking like a know-it-all, correcting the corrector, a, a speck inspector, as we talked about before. Ask God to show you the ways that you can change, ways that you can serve your leadership, ways that you can be better in your family in humility, better in the society and culture that you live in. My friends, the one who says they have no pride is the one that's prideful the most. So I hope that this lesson has blessed you. Check out the blog for the resources on the books we mentioned in the lesson. And I pray that you are humble and come back more humble than you've ever been because I enjoy doing these lessons with you. And I hope that you're teachable and ready to change the world. Disciples are humble. Have a great week and I'll see you soon. God bless you.